Welcome to worship here at St. Matthew. We're so happy you're here to continue our Easter celebration. This is St. Matthew Lutheran in Hawthorne Woods, Illinois, especially for those who are not uh, in the room. You may be somewhere else in the world, but we are here uh, in rainy Hawthorne Woods today. Uh, and it is a beautiful day. Otherwise, because we are celebrating again, because Jesus has risen from the dead, we are born again to a living hope. That's the first in a new message series that we are doing here at St. Matthew through the Easter season based on the readings and writings of 1 Peter. I'd like you to fill out the We Care card. I know I say that to you every single week, but it's important for us to keep those track because I just got re received word that we, have, uh, we, we need to submit our, um, our data to the Missouri Synod. So it just reminded me again, that's how we keep our data for the Missouri Synod so they, they can keep track of, of the stewardship of the church. So. Uh, put those fill, filled out week here cards in the offering plate when we get to that point in the service. And online you may fill out a registration form. There's a link in the stream's description. Click on that, it opens a new window. Invite, share the stream, invite others to worship with us as well. There's a blank half sheet of paper in your uh, messenger and you can write down questions or comments that you think a pastor can answer or comment on and address. So put that down throughout the worship service and then at the end of the service you'll be able to uh, turn those in in the basket in the back and that becomes the podcast on Wednesdays, Coffee and Word Reflection with Pastor B at 11 o'clock on our website. As we celebrate Holy Communion today, if you're a member of a Lutheran Church Missouri Synod congregation and are a guest with us today, you are invited to participate because it's just like in your church. If you're a member of another Christian faith tradition congregation, or maybe you're not a member of a church at all, read about our teachings and practice of Holy Communion. It is in the Messenger and on the We Care card. We will be having a statement of faith from Kira Dwyer a little bit later on today. And uh, that's our last of our class uh, this year. Uh, she, so we saved the best for last for you. And that will take the place of the feeding of the lambs today. You had the kids already up here anyway, and they were doing a great job and sharing the gospel of Jesus, which is part of our shine event for this week as well. So that will be after the, gospel, uh, the, after the reading uh, today, which is not a gospel reading. It's from the first Peter, and then we'll have uh, Kira come up. So let's begin by singing... Not only uh, may the peoples praise you, but also he is risen and may the Lord bless our worship today.
early morning break of dawn, stumbling to the tomb, standing awestruck, wondering who rolled away the stone. And as the sun came up, amazed they looked inside and saw an angel cloaked in light. Don't be afraid. Sing with all creation, sing of the world made new. Endless life we too may live, bursting from the tomb. And looking up, we see a king enthroned on high. His wounds of love new In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Together, let us pray to the Lord. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God, through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're reading from 1 Peter 1, okay, and together we're going to read verse 3 out loud. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith in for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. He is the Son of God who came to earth to save me from my sins. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Jesus provides me with a safe home, a loving family, and plenty of food. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Because I know Jesus, I want to help others be kind and give back. I know who Jesus is from the Bible. I want to be a follower of Jesus and listen to God and let him guide me throughout my life. 
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. I do not need to fear the bad in the world, because Jesus is with me. Jesus was born to be my substitute, and he lived a perfect life for me. He died on the cross for me to save me from my sins. He did this because I cannot avoid all temptations of the devil. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. Because of this, I know that I will have eternal life. This is important to me, and I want to continue my faith in Jesus. As a member of the church, I will continue to come to, wor to worship services weekly and help at Sunday school. I will also continue participating in community service through sharing the joy at St. Matthew and Buddy Break at Hope Collective and more. Through these and other activities, I will spread the word of God and allow him to guide me through my life. Good job. Thank you, Kira. She wrote that herself. I didn't write it for her. Mom didn't write it for her. So she did a great job. I thank you for that. That wonderful gospel presentation from the 23rd Psalm.
Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. It's a new day, and it is a new season in the church here. So we start a new series of messages called Born Again, based on the readings that we'll be hearing over the next couple weeks from 1 Peter. In fact, the next two Sundays, this one, the second Sunday after Easter, and next Sunday, the third Sunday after Easter, feature readings from 1 Peter that actually use that phrase, born again. And the New Testament uses this phrase in a couple different places. John in his gospel, John 3, as well as Peter in his first letter, or what we call an epistle. The actual use of of this word in the original Greek language. It's a, it's a uh, different variations from John to Peter that we typically translate born again. But I think that as we dig down a little bit deeper into that, you're going to see that they have a nuance to them uh, that I think can lead us to further interpretation. Let's start in John 3. John 3 is the story of Jesus' birth, uh, Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, that Jesus says to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again... He cannot see the kingdom of God. But upon further investigation of this phrase from, uh, I was looking at the um, uh, dictionary, theological dictionary of the New Testament that was gifted to me by a couple people from here at St. Matthew for my Bible studies uh, that I've been using quite extensively. It, It tells me that in the original language, this word is better translated, typically we see it born again, it should be rather born from above. In other words, what Jesus is telling Nicodemus and ultimately is telling us because it's recorded for all of us in John's Gospel is that in order to see the kingdom of God, which in itself means to be saved, we must be born from above or even more specific, born from heaven. Then we move over to 1 Peter 1.3 and in this first letter of Peter's he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So Peter's use of this phrase, again, translated born again, just like in John 3 in most English Bibles, but this one actually does mean born again. But it emphasizes that this birth is not your typical human birth, it is something that is specifically and only from God himself. A miracle that cannot be truly replicated by humans. Subtle differences, I understand. But I would say that these two accounts of being born again are actually similar enough to be described as being two sides of the same coin. Let's go back to John 3 for a second. Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and we're at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He had just changed water into wine, and he's about to go to Samaria and meet the woman at the well. In between those two, we have Nicodemus at night coming to converse with Jesus. He comes at night because he doesn't want anybody to see him. It's a secret meeting. The reason for this is that Nicodemus actually sits on the Jewish ruling council, what we would call the Sanhedrin. And he didn't want them to know that he was going to talk to Jesus because they already are not happy with Jesus. This would be the same ruling council that three years later will condemn Jesus for blasphemy and will urge Pilate successfully to crucify Jesus. Now, Nicodemus will not agree to that. He will rule against that. He will vote against that in the uh, Jewish ruling council. And he actually then, we're told, is a believer of Jesus by that time, probably because of this conversation three years earlier recorded in John 3. Although he's still a believer in secret until after Jesus dies, and then he and Joseph of Arimathea feel like no, no more time for secrecy. And I think that makes Nicodemus a lot like us today. Maybe even you. He's got questions. He's struggling with deep theological and spiritual questions in his heart. And he's heard about the miracle of changing water into wine. He's heard about some of the teachings of Jesus. And so he's going to go to the source of all his questions. And he knows where the answer must be. It is in Jesus. So he goes and speaks to Jesus. Now Jesus in turn speaks with Nicodemus, but he uses language illustrations, words, that Nicodemus can more readily understand. And the illustration that really hits home 
with Nicodemus catches his attention right off the bat is that phrase, born again. Jesus saying you need to be born again in order to be saved. And it takes Nicodemus it back at first. Oh, why are you talking about born again? I've got to go into my mother's womb again as an old man. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 that's not what I mean at all. And so he lovingly explains it throughout John 3. And so Nicodemus becomes a believer, so much so that he and Joseph of Arimathea will take Jesus' lifeless body and bury it in Joseph's tomb Friday evening. Thirty years after this happens, Peter takes pen to paper, and he writes to what we think is a predominantly Greek-speaking Christians in Asia Minor, or modern-day Turkey. And as such, he's going to use language and, and words and illustrations that they can more readily understand. And again, our English Bibles will translate born again as one of the phrases that he uses, but he's using a different type of word here. It's got the same root word, but it tells us a little bit something more than what John records in John chapter 3. So, actually, Jesus, John, and Peter are all using a language or a phrase or a wording that the immediate audience can more readily understand and relate to. And I think that's also deliberate because today in America, we're finding out that we have a similar situation. We have that phrase, born again, but what do we mean by it? So I want to take a moment to cover two ways that American Christians understand the phrase born again. There are those among, uh, amongst us as Christians who understand this phrase born again as referring to a deeply religious experience, a spiritual experience. They'll even use further words to describe it, a spirit baptism or being born of the spirit. That's what they mean by born again. And Christians who define born again this way typically do not talk about water baptism. Now, the talking, they're, what they're talking about is a spiritual experience that is a deeply personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not disparaging that belief. I think God does want to have that kind of relationship with us. But when it starts to supersede or even completely replace water Baptism, the sacrament of holy baptism. That's where I got to say, I, time out. Because remember what Jesus himself commissions the church to do. This is recorded in Matthew 28. Go into all the world. Make disciples of all nations. How? By baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the word baptism means to apply water. And so water with these words of God, the Holy Spirit comes on them and they are born again. There are not two different types of baptisms then. This is clearly taught in scripture as well as clearly confessed by those Christians that will confess the Nicene Creed. And in the Nicene Creed we would call ourselves the one holy Christian and apostolic church and we confess that we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And so St. Paul says clearly, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. That's Ephesians 4 verse 5. And so Lutherans understand what Peter and Jesus' phrase means. Born again is truly gospel, good news. Because in an increasingly hopeless world, the resurrection of Jesus, which is what baptism really is, it's making us participate, making us a part of the resurrection of Jesus, we are born again to a living hope. Even just a cursory glance or a glimpse at the world will tell you that we are living in an increasingly hopeless world. The threat of nations being invaded by other nations, the threat of nuclear war, the pain of failing marriages, the fear of the safety of our children in schools, increasingly hopeless. But what, remember what we celebrated last Sunday, just seven days ago. Alleluia, Christ is risen! Excellent, you're awake. I love it. Remember, that's not just a one-time event. 
Easter is not just one day out of the year for Christians. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a uh, all-time celebration, every day, but especially every Sunday. The resurrection is a life-changing event, and it changes who we really are. And it also can change our world, because it causes us to be born again, to a new way of living now, but also, not only in this world, but to a new future. A new world is in our future. That's what we're born again to, to a living hope and a new world. You know, there's nothing quite so hopeless as a cemetery. A cemetery is in all of our future, sad to say, because we are all sinners. God warned our first parents, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you are not to eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. But eat of it they did and sends us all to a lifetime of sin. And remember what Paul says in Romans, the wages of sin is death. So cemeteries remind us of this, as nothing, a few other things can really remind us of it. Cemeteries are stark, cemeteries are final. They are a constant reminder that death is our future, a constant reminder of hopelessness. And what else comes with all this sin and death and hopelessness? The hopelessness of a marriage ending, the hopelessness of not being able to find meaningful work, the hopelessness of not being able to find life-sustaining medicine, the hopelessness of shootings and murder every single day on the streets of our cities, the hopelessness of a never-ending war. There's always war someplace, right? The hopelessness of rising prices not met by rising salaries, the hopelessness of our sinful human nature. And in our sinful human nature, we tend to look for hope in all the wrong places, right? Many people will turn to alcohol and drugs, maybe not so much to find hope as if, to, as if they, they want to use it to numb the hopelessness in their lives. But others do turn to relationships. The current relationship isn't working, so they turn to someone else. And then when someone else doesn't bring that hope to their life, then they turn to someone else, and on and on and on it goes. Others bury themselves in work, in a career, or looking for hope in making more money. None of this brings the hope that we are looking for. Because hope can only come from one place, an empty tomb. And hope can only come from one person, Jesus Christ, the living Christ. 2,000 years ago in a cemetery outside of Jerusalem came the greatest news of all. The tomb that Nicodemus and Joseph put Jesus in on Friday evening is empty by Sunday morning. And that means that our graves will be empty on the last day. And we believe in a living Christ, and our living Christ brings hope to all our hopeless situations. Now it may surprise you that of all people it's Peter who speaks of this living hope and writes of it. The same Peter who fell far and hard into hopelessness. He denied knowing Jesus three times over the span of just a couple of minutes and in hopeless despair we're told he weeps bitterly as Jesus is condemned and Jesus is crucified, and Jesus is buried. But Peter never fully gave up hope, not like Judas did. There is still a flicker of hope in Peter. And the very next day, on Sunday, Peter sees the empty tomb. And, that, and a few hours later, Peter sees Jesus. And a few weeks later, Peter comes to know this living hope in a very personal way, as Jesus specifically talks to Peter and commissions him to be a messenger of hope to the church and to the world. And he commissions him the same amount of, time, same amount of, time, of times that he denied Jesus. Three times he tells him to feed my sheep, feed my lambs with living hope. And so Peter is speaking to you today to fan into flame that flicker of hope that is still inside of you. Peter tells you clearly that hope comes from, this living hope comes from, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not by you, but by God's great mercy. He knows, so listen to him. And in God's great mercy, you are then born again. 
not just in to, to a new situation or to fix a broken relationship or to, bring, to, be, to begin a new job or to find a new doctor for your life. Although those things may happen, not only is this living hope for the world now, but in God's great mercy, you are born again to a living hope to be new people altogether. The word that Peter uses to trans, that we translate as born again literally means in the Greek to be begotten anew from above. This is something magnitude times more powerful and profound than our English phrase, born again. Completely outside of us are we made new. Completely outside and and does nothing to do with what we do, God does it all. After all, he created us, he gave us free will so that we could freely choose to love him, but even though we rejected him in our sin, God does what is necessary to forgive that sin, so we are now begotten or born again anew from above, from him, and through the, and this is all through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, chooses to take our sins on himself, and pay the wages of those sins on the cross. And three days later, we know what happened. He rose from the dead. He signified that God accepted his sacrifice as complete, as the book of Hebrews calls it, once and for all. And now you and I are, as Peter says, born again. That's what we celebrated last week. And that's why we're celebrating the resurrection this week, because we are born again We are being born again, always comes back to the resurrection. So we remember our baptisms, which by daily contrition and repentance, we drown, we bury the old Adam, just as Jesus was buried, and, and a new man arises just as Jesus rose from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus gives us this living hope that we are so desperately looking for in this life. So are you feeling hopeless? Have you felt hopeless? I'm sad to say you're going to feel hopeless again because that's part, of what's li- that, that, that's part of the life that we live in this sinful world. There is going to be some hopelessness. So what do you do? As followers of Jesus, here's what we do. One, we turn to God. Open his word. Listen to him speak to you through his word. Begin each day with a friendly voice and a hopeful voice, the voice of God, as you read his word. Gather here each week to hear his word, to meditate on his word, and to receive his word in, with, and under the bread and the wine. And this is how much God loves you and wants you to be born again to a living hope. He gives you a family to turn to. A godly family is filled with hope when you are feeling hopeless. You can turn to them because most likely they know you better than anyone else in the world other than God. Now it may be true that they are not able to figure out why you're hopeless or that you are hopeless or that you are frustrated or that you're in need of some kind of hope. After all, they're sinful human beings just like you. Talk to them anyway. Call a family meeting. Set up a weekly family dinner where you put the phones away, you look each other in the eyes, and you talk. Tell them how you're feeling. Because they're family. They love you. Lean into that God-given gift of family. Not only tell them how you're feeling, but also tell them how they could help you. Walk through this together. Work through this together. Because that's why God gave us a family. To bring his hope. A living hope that comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me close this off with a story that you may have heard before. Britain's Derek Redmond dreamed all his life of winning a gold medal in the 400 meter race, and his dream was in sight as the gun sounded in the semifinals at the Barcelona Olympics. He's running the race of his life. He's way out ahead, and he could see the finish line as he, run, as he starts to turn into the back stretch, and suddenly he felt a sharp pain shoot down his, the back of his leg. He fell face first into the track with a torn right hamstring. Medical attendants were approaching. Redmond fought to his feet. It was an animal instinct, he would let her say. He set out to hop in a crazed attempt to try to finish the race. And when he reached the stretch, the last straightaway towards the finish line, a large man in a t-shirt came out of the stands, hurled aside the security guard that was trying to keep him off the track. He ran to Redmond. He embraced him. And his name was Jim Redmond, Derek's father. You don't have to do this, he told his weeping son. Yes, I do, said Derek. Well then, said Jim, we're going to finish this together. 
And they did. They fought off the security men. The son's head was sometimes buried in his father's shoulder due to the pain. They stayed in Derek's lane all the way to the finish line. The crowd gaped and then rose and howled and wept. Derek didn't walk away with a medal. In fact, he was disqualified because he didn't finish the race on his own. But what he did walk away with was an incredible memory of his father, who, when he saw his son in pain, ran to him, picked him up, and helped him finish the race. That's what Jesus Christ does for us. When we go down, when we get beaten down by hopelessness and frustration, Jesus Christ, in his boundless love for us, jumps into our lives, brings us to our feet, and carries us across the finish line. When all feels hopeless, the resurrection of Jesus Christ causes us to be born again to a living, boundless hope. Amen. If you are able, please stand with me. Let's confess our Christian faith, in, and we'll use the words of the Nicene Creed. Together, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We'll gather our tithes, our offerings, as well as our We Care cards as we sing Revelation song.
Father, we come before your throne of grace with thanksgiving for all the blessings you've given to us, but especially the blessing of being able to come to you as a father, as children come to their father to ask for what we need, our desires and our wants as well, but knowing that your will be done, and because it is good and perfect, you, you know us better than we know ourselves. Lord, it's so hopeless in this world because of sin, but we are thankful, Lord, that you have caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and all this because of your great mercy to us. Help us to live in that living hope and to proclaim that living hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, you have given to this place, St. Matthew Lutheran, 160 years going on of mission and ministry. And it has been because of your great mercy and love, resources and gifts, and the time and the talent and the treasure that you give to your people. So we're thankful, Lord, for all those this day who rise up to meet the needs that are met, that are out there with the boundless love of Jesus. We're especially praying for today the Board of Christian Education, Becca Carlson, Laura LaCroix, John Lawrenson, Richard Warning, Jeff Davis, and Susan Hutchins. Lord, in your mercy. Father, throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus went around doing good, and some of the good that he did was to heal those who are sick, those who were in need of healing, and even raise the dead. So, Lord, we bring before you in our prayers those that we know and have asked for healing prayers. Scott Haste, who will undergo knee surgery this week. Also, Carol Andrews, Leon Hapke, Marvin Sneller, Eleanor Francisco, Pam Best, Linda Weir, Marilyn Ellinghusen, Lorraine Seltzer, Marilyn Schauer, Judy Newth, Carl Reen, Marjorie Meyer, Dan Seaworth Sr., and Rose Marie Schmidt. Also, friends of St. Matthew, Owen Foster, Whitman Williams, Judy Harrison, Mary Joellen, Michelle, Pete, Brittany Thody, Dave Gromnitz, Peggy, Lynn, D. Stryker, Joan, Rita Holmes, Hank Rommel, and Tom Anderson. We pray for those who are receiving hospice care, especially John Mueller, for those who are homebound, especially Mary Lou Brita, and those that we name in the quiet of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, Lord, we bring before you those who wear our nation's uniform that go and put themselves in harm's way or are willing to so that we may be defended and so that we may worship you in spirit and in truth and in freedom. We hold up before you Elise Nielsen, Adam Imaoka, Stephen and I Sandy, Justin Brown, Scott Karras, Bob Hamilton, Chandler McLean, and all those who serve in our armed forces. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we bring all these prayers and petitions to you through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is resurrected and a living Christ who now brings us to living hope. We're thankful, Lord, that he also has taught us to pray. Let's stand and pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Scripture very clearly shows that we are sinners, but we, know, we know, have, don't have to look any further than our own lives and in our world today to see that there is sin and that we are also part of this sinful world. And so I ask you, do you confess that you are a sinner, knowing that as you confess and repent by the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ will give you forgiveness? Then answer, I do confess. Because Jesus has died on the cross, shed his blood for the forgiveness of all your sins. He now gives us his body and blood to eat and to drink. And so I ask you, do you confess that Jesus' words are true, that in, with, and under the bread and the wine is his body and blood for us Christians to eat and drink for the forgiveness of sin, salvation, and everlasting life? Then answer, I do so confess. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, by his authority, not mine, I am honored to be able to announce to you the grace of God, and in the stead and by the command of Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, 
Eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated as we sing Amazing Grace and receive the sacrament.
please stand if you're able. May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and preserve you in the true faith until you reach life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have refreshed us once again with this good and gracious gift of your Son's body and blood. May this refresh us and instill in us a living hope that comes from the resurrection of Jesus so that we may go out into the world and love our neighbor by sharing with them the good news that Jesus is alive, forgives our sins, and is coming back to take us to be in paradise forever. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Have a seat. A couple things I need to share with you before we head out today. Um, spiritual gifts survey. We, f we started filling those out again last Sunday, uh, Easter Sunday. You may have done it also in November, but if you had not done so either the last week or in November, do so. Uh, go on our website. Uh, or contact the church office to fill that out. We need your surveys. We need your spiritual gifts. What you think is a good gift from God that you can use, and no matter what it is. And we'll find a spot for you because we have such exciting things happening this summer. Also want to make sure that uh, you are good stewards of the resources that God has given to you because we have exciting things happening that are going to require some uh, financial resources. We have uh, a special uh, by, uh, leader for our BBS uh, that we're going to finalize plans this week with, a student from Concordia. Uh, that will come down and lead our opening and closing of our VBS. Uh, she is uh, specifically gifted for that with guitar, but she uh, will also have somebody else uh, doing music, but she'll be here for, to help us with that, and we want to help her with some tuition uh, as well for, for doing this for us, and, and we'll give her some room and board as well. And uh, I talked to the district president last Friday, uh, two days ago, and uh, he uh, said, 95% sure you're getting a candidate from St. Louis. So there's a 5% chance there won't. You know, I don't want to say it's a, it's, a, it's a lock, certainly, because we'll know for sure a week from Wednesday, but it's 95% according to him. So if it doesn't happen, we know who to go for. Yeah, it's, it's President Buss. Uh, but uh, we are going to plan then on showing uh, the stream or, or having the stream of the call service here on the screens in the church that night. Uh, it starts at 7 o'clock. We'll also send out a link to it if you'd like to uh, follow the service on your own uh, at, at home. Uh, it, and they'll probably get to the names about 7.30 or so. Uh, it's usually a half hour to 45 minutes into the worship service. There's special music and special guests, and uh, there, it is a full-blown service with a, with a sermon as, uh, as well. So uh, we'll have that here. If you want to come here and sit with your brothers and sisters and watch it, uh, we'll have it starting at 7 o'clock. Uh, and then what we're going to be listening for is a name, uh, and that what they do is they, they announce the name, and then they'll announce where they're going. Northern Illinois District, St. Matthew Lutheran Church in Hawthorne Woods. So that's what we're looking for. And on the 26th, then we should know that. So let's make sure that we're being good stewards of our resources as well as our spiritual gifts for this summer. It's going to be a filled summer. Also, don't forget about the pig roast. We, we reminded you of that. Tickets are on sale. Tickets are being sold. So we're starting to get some early bird tickets. Remember, they're, they're $15. The $20 ticket is now $15 until August 1st. I know that's four months away, but you can never start too soon. And we also use donations and sponsorships. That stuff is in the church office if you want to uh, find I think there, there may be stuff on the back uh, in the narthex as well um, where you can buy your tickets and then find out about more uh, information on sponsorships. Uh, LWML is meeting today. The ladies, some of the ladies from early service or last night are starting to come in, and that's good. They're going to have a lunch, and this is the last meeting before the convention, so very important meeting. All the ladies are invited. They uh, are going to start talking about the new... Um, uh, mission grants that they're raising money for. So please come to that as well, uh, ladies. Uh, we have uh, uh, this dream of starting a kindergarten in the fall. Here we've had this dream for quite some time now. And um, again, we may be misinterpreting what God wants us to do uh, in this way, but this is where we feel God is leading us. So we want you to help by finding people who have kindergarten age children. They're ready to go into kindergarten. Let them know that they can call our school office and set up an uh, interview as well as a tour, and they can interview the, the teacher who is already on staff for the kindergarten uh, that begins after Labor Day. Uh, so we'd love to get that going as soon as possible. Get them enrolled, okay, so we know how much to plan for. 
To, to that end, our kindergarten teacher is going to have a kindergarten day camp in June and July, one week at a time, for children who have just finished preschool then by that point, and then they'll be going through the stuff that they will be doing in kindergarten for a week, get some prepared for it. So uh, there's information in the messengers, there's information on our website, keep that in your prayers and, my, and on mine. There's still time to sign up for the Women's Guild presentation of Betty Crocker, her cookbook that changed America. The Women's Guild of St. Matthew is sponsoring this. And the event is in a couple weeks on May 7th. So sign up in the church office if you'd like to attend. So if you're able, let's stand and conclude our worship this morning before we head on to the mission field with my hope. will change if all the plans I make go wrong your love stays the same if life will guide me through it all I'm hanging on I'm leaning in to you nothing can reach the end of all your faithfulness your grace is with me
Bye.